Vanadium redox flow batteries were once considered a weird novelty that might never really work. But not anymore, that's for sure. They're being built at massive scale at a number of, in fact, many locations around the world. And quietly, the vanadium redox flow battery is actually undermining lithium ion mega batteries from companies like Tesla and CATL. And there's one very good reason for that. They are actually cheaper. And they work, well, they work just as well. But most people don't have any idea how vanadium redox flow batteries actually work and why governments around the world are now beginning to install them. I'll explain why that's all happening in this video. Here in Australia, there's a lot of money being invested into these batteries. Redox flow batteries are the real deal. They are going to take a percentage of the battery market away from lithium, away from sodium. And some of the projects being built around the world are actually enormous. In fact, I believe this is the biggest redox flow battery the world has ever seen. And it's just not just a massive redox flow battery. It's actually one of the biggest batteries the world has ever seen. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the channel. Great to have you with us. I'm Sam Evans. You're watching The Electric Viking. Flexbase Group has begun building what will be, I believe, the largest flow battery in Europe and potentially in the entire world. It's breaking ground on a, an 800 megawatt slash 1.6 gigawatt hour redox flow battery in Switzerland or Swiss, as they say there. The project combines utility scale storage with an AI data center and district heating network in a very ambitious multi-use development. It shows you if you're in the United States, you don't need a nuclear power plant to run a, an AI data center. You can do it with renewable energy. It's much better, it's cheaper. The Swiss developer started developing and building the technology center earlier this month after securing regulatory approval with commercial operations scheduled for summer of 2028. The facility will span 20,000 square meters at Laufenberg's grid interconnection hub located at the junction of Swiss, German, and French transmission networks with 41 cross border lines. So what exactly are these redox flow batteries? Well, in the 1970s, during an era of energy price shocks, NASA, or NASA, designing, well, started designing a liquid battery, which was unusual. The iron chromium redox flow battery contained no corrosive elements and was designed to be easily scalable, cheap to manufacture, and it could store huge amounts of solar energy indefinitely. Several years later, in Australia, a young chemical engineer at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, which is two hours from where I live, named Maria Skylus, started studying these new kinds of flow batteries. Within years, she and her research team developed another kind of flow battery, one that used vanadium instead of iron and chromium. Like the NASA design, it was safe, reliable, long lasting, and it was actually easily scalable. Unfortunately, there wasn't much of a market for energy storage at the time. There wasn't much solar. In fact, very, very little solar worldwide. So there just wasn't any need for these massive batteries. We understood at the time we were 20 years too early, said Professor Skylus. The University of New South Wales filed a patent in 1986 and a 200 kilowatt slash 800 kilowatt hour battery system was installed in Japan. It was the first large scale implementation of this technology. In the late 1990s, UNSW sold the patent to an Australian company, Pinnacle Renewable Energy, which failed to commercialize the project. That original patent passed through a series of corporate owners before it actually expired. Still, the market for energy storage didn't exist. Then suddenly, everything changed. One turning point, professor, the professor said, was the 2016 South Australian blackout. Elon Musk came along and said, I can build a battery in 100 days. And everyone realized you can build big batteries. And because we had a whole lot of solar at the time, all this solar was being wasted. We had the duck curve coming in. Middle of the day, there's massive amounts of power. And when we really needed it was when everyone was getting home from work. What type of battery should be built? That was the question. Lithium ion batteries had a big head start as the US government and the Chinese government poured billions of dollars into funding the technology 
including companies like Tesla and CATL. Tesla built gigafactories able to produce the batteries at relatively low cost, repackaging them from China. They had a huge capacity available to manufacture lithium batteries, said the professor. And so, almost by default, lithium iron became the technology of choice for grid energy storage. But it might not have been the best solution. However, this is beginning to change. When a commercial district in Trondheim, Norway, recently commissioned battery energy storage, it made an unusual choice. And a lot of people raised their eyebrows. Instead of ordering lithium iron, it went with VRFB, a vanadium redox flow battery. One of the main reasons for this was the lower cost, said Bisard Oluri, co-founder of the Norwegian company that installed the battery, Brighter Batteries. Another related reason was that with proper maintenance, the battery could actually technically last forever. You cannot say that about sodium or lithium batteries. You get huge benefits both in terms of environment, but also the lifetime costs, Mr. Oluri said, speaking from Trondheim. The remarkable property of vanadium redox flow batteries has seen them being described as the next big technology for large scale energy storage. Dozens of companies around the world are now manufacturing and installing megawatt scale vanadium redox flow batteries. Late last year, renewables developer North Harbour Clean Energy announced plans to build what would be Australia's largest VRFB. With four megawatts of power, the amount of energy that can flow in and out of the battery in any given instant and 16 megawatt hours of capacity. Along with a joint venture partner, they also promised to build a vanadium redox flow battery assembly and manufacturing line in Eastern Australia to meet gigawatt hours demand for long duration energy storage in the national electricity market here. To understand why VFRB batteries have been getting this attention, let's have a look about at how they actually work. A battery is a device that stores chemical energy and converts it to electrical energy. It does this through chemical reactions that creates a flow of electrons from one material to another. The flow or electric current is what we call electricity. Beyond this, different kinds of batteries work in different ways. In a lithium ion battery, energy in the form of lithium ions is stored in the solid anode and cathode. When you charge your phone, this charger passes current to the battery and lithium ions move from the cathode to the anode. When you unplug, this process is reversed. But there's a problem. The interaction of lithium ions and electrodes gradually, slowly, over time, degrades the battery. We've worked out how to make that degradation much slower than what it used to be, but it still will eventually degrade. As a result, your phone battery has an average lifespan without proper thermal management, of two to three years or 300 to 500 charge cycles. And it holds less charge as it ages, particularly because it gets hot and it has no way of really cooling itself properly. VRFB systems sidestep this problem of overheating. In theory, they can be charged and discharged an unlimited number of times with no capacity degradation, said Chris Menictus, head of the energy storage and refrigeration lab at UNSW. The electrolyte never degrades, he said. VF, VRFBs do this through taking advantage of a special property of vanadium. It has four different stages of oxidation, meaning the same element can have four different charges. As with other batteries, charge is created through a chemical reaction. But in this case, the reaction is between differently charged ions of the same element. So the electrolyte doesn't degrade. Plus, there are some advantages. Unlike lithium ion batteries, VRFB can be completely discharged and it doesn't hurt the battery. Now, yes, lithium ion phosphate batteries can do that too. However, VFRB batteries can store energy for very, very long periods of time with no negative effects. Because of the liquid electrolyte, they're also, well, very unlikely to catch fire. Scaling up capacity is also easier than with a lithium ion battery instead of having to connect together millions of small self-contained cells, you simply get one enormous tank of electrolyte, depending on how big your battery is, make the tank bigger. Finally, vanadium is more abundant in the Earth's crust than lithium, and therefore less vulnerable to supply bottlenecks. I think it's a very exciting time, said the professor who originally discovered these batteries. Large scale batteries are needed more than ever. And I think vanadium is one of the leading technologies, but there's a catch. 
VRFBs, why don't we use them for cars? Well, there's a very good reason. They are much less energy dense than lithium ion batteries, meaning they're generally too big and heavy to be used for phones, cars, or even for home energy storage. However, unlike lithium ion batteries, they ha also have moving parts that pump. However, unlike lithium ion batteries, they also have moving parts, which are the pumps that produce the flow of electrolyte solution. And although vanadium is more abundant than lithium, it's expensive to extract. Most of the world's supply is used in refining steel. So its price tends to be volatile, increasing in response to demand for steel. As a result, vanadium batteries currently have a higher upfront cost than lithium batteries with the same capacity. However, they do last a lot longer. Since they're big, heavy, and expensive to buy, the use of vanadium batteries is going to be limited to industrial and grid scale applications where they work perfectly. According to Dr. Menictus, batteries via vanadium flow batteries actually work out cheaper than lithium ion batteries for these particular applications. As you start increasing the storage time, vanadium becomes cheaper, he said. At more than three hours storage, vanadium is cheaper than lithium ion. And the price of these batteries is appearing to go down in sync with the price declines of lithium ion phosphate and lithium ternary batteries. Storage time or capacity is a function of the amount of stored electrolyte or basically the size of the tanks. Since VF VRFBs are most cost efficient with massive size, they're probably going to be very big. So that, that, that's why you might never see one in your backyard or to be honest, uh, powering any kind of electrical device because they just don't make sense. But putting them beside solar farms and next to places like where there used to be old coal power plants would be the perfect location for them. Now, as you can see, these vanadium redox flow batteries are being installed around the world. Yeah, Norway, Switzerland, Swiss, uh, they're being built in Australia, even in the United States as well. So once, these, once upon a time, this technology was considered novel and new and maybe not really worth investing in, but that has completely changed. And the market for this battery technology is growing enormously. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Bye-bye.